Take these beads in appreciation for your bravery. I'm sure Scorpius will reward you even more. Oh, goody. Beads. I was hoping for power, wealth, or maybe some sort of fancy title, but, but yeah, I guess beads will do just fine after I helped you acquire this powerful energy source. I mean, with beads, I can... wear them. I wonder if Lothor's hiring. Welcome, my friends, to Power Rangers Lost Galaxy. Go, go, Power Rangers! This was the point in the franchise where, for me personally, things started to change. As a kid, I had begun to stop watching Power Rangers during Turbo because of a combination of two things. One, I was so utterly bored by and contemptuous of the season. What with the cast changeover, the Cars theme not being of any interest, and just what I felt were boring stories at the time. And two... Well, I was aging out of the target demographic anyway. One of the reasons why kids' shows tend to not last longer than a few years is because the people it's made for, little kids, grow up, and if you have a continuing story, it's harder for a new generation to come along and replace them. It's actually easier these days to keep kids watching longer thanks to streaming services offering the whole show for them, but it's still the exception rather than the rule. Kids move on to other properties, don't have the same attachment to what came before. The fact that it was back to new episodes every Saturday as opposed to releasing them on weekdays was also a pain. This was before I had TiVo and I was growing out of waking up early on Saturday mornings to watch TV. In Space brought me back to the franchise and got me excited about it all again, so when they announced Lost Galaxy, I was naturally going to keep watching, but I only watched it for a few episodes before I gave up on Power Rangers. For one thing, starting with this season, it was decided to have each series be as standalone as they could. Every season was a new cast, and they downplay references to previous seasons and teams, though most seasons we did get one or two episodes where they'd team up with the previous season's Rangers. As such, I didn't really feel any connection to this new team. In my mind, who were these strangers who were becoming Power Rangers? Sure, Turbo had screwed over the continuity of teams, but Demetria and Zordon didn't object to the four we got, and Andros was responsible for giving them the space powers. What made these five so damn worthy of carrying the name of Power Rangers? Who the hell were they to live up to the people who had just saved the universe? Well, that was my attitude at the time, at least. I don't think it helped that they didn't get their powers until the second episode. Sure, both Zeo and In Space didn't get their until the second episode for their respective series, but the momentum from the season finales helped carry them. In this case, we're introduced to an entirely new cast, and we have to wait a week before they actually get their powers. These days, it is more common for this to happen, but back then, this was uncharted territory. I say either give them the powers in the first episode, or air both parts on the same day. Production-wise, if adapting a Sentai that had barely anything to do with space into a space opera was daunting, Lost Galaxy had an even more uphill battle. The Sentai this time was a series called Ginga Man, which was nature-themed. However, because of the success of In Space, the producers wanted to have another Power Rangers series be space-themed. As such, they had to get creative about it. The story involves a space colony that was traveling across the universe along with habitat domes that could be used for Zord battles and fights in woods and whatnot. It's a nice way of having your cake and eating it too. Sure, there's a bit of a clash between the more mystical powers versus is the science fiction atmosphere, but that instead allows for character themes and development to be the focus. While technically this season is a standalone one, with a new cast that will be leaving after its run is up, it is still considered by some to be part of the Zordon era, despite the lack of Zordon. And it's easy to see why. Not only do we get some familiar elements like a few characters making appearances from the previous season, those same elements and characters establish that this is a post-Countdown to Destruction world, where things have developed. It's a whole new ball game with new technologies and a new culture, one that future seasons would pretty much ignore for the sake of establishing a new status quo, but let's not dwell on that. We begin with Quasar Quest. Sometime in the not too distant future. Way down in deep 13. We open on an alien world where an old dude is expositing about the five Quasar Sabers that have been embedded in the rocks for 3,000 years. There they'll remain until five people with attitude worthy of them can pull them from the rocks and transform into warriors for great justice. It's a nice nod to Arthurian lore with the sword and the stone, and I'm a fan of that stuff, so I'm already into this. Well, it's not like this is gonna bring up King Arthur or anything like that. Chivalry, knightly fealty to a leader, and honorable combat are recurring motifs in this season. 
A ceremony begins where some beefy guys and at least one woman try to pull them out, but none are successful. They're interrupted by an attack by the foot soldiers this season, called Stingwingers. They're led by a being called Furio, who looks like he has a lemon that melted on his head. As the crowd disperses, he tries to pull out one of the sabers, but it goes about as well as you'd expect. The theme song is... Okay. I don't think it comes off quite as epic as other themes. It feels like there are less lyrics than previous seasons, and it just doesn't have that same addictive quality that previous seasons have had. I think the problem is that the lyrics don't really feel like they're telling us anything about the show. Consider, the original Go Go Power Rangers was a full song with two verses, Zeo was a sequel song that talked about the powers being even stronger than before, Turbo was about the cars thing, once again trying to talk about the powers being new and different, and In Space was the finale of it, flying higher than ever before. Lost Galaxy's theme seems to want to tell a story, but it runs out of time before it can tell the story, saying, you'll go to a galaxy, and then there lies the key to the answer and your powers. Except nobody in this series requires an answer, or even a key to the answer. Again, it's not bad at all, but I just don't think it's their best. Anyway, we cut to the massive space colony Terra Venture, where we're introduced to a few characters very quickly. The leader of the colony, Commander Stanton, head security officer Mike Corbett, and a scientist for the colony named Kendricks Morgan. Terra Venture is set to leave Earth in search of a new world. Though why the hell they're bothering with a huge-ass colony instead of sending out smaller exploratory vessels is never explained. However, we can assume that with how advanced the colony is, it was probably built using reverse-engineered technology from the Dark Fortress after Andros landed it on Earth. Speaking of Earth, we cut to a spaceport where we see dozens of people trying to get tickets to board TerraVenture, and of course, who should we see but Professor Phenomenus and Bulk? Bulk wonders if they're forgetting something, and we cut to Skull, in bed with earmuffs on as his alarm goes off. Also, he's wearing lipstick while he sleeps for some reason. Jason Narvi, who played Skull, was leaving the show to go to college, and since then has become a teacher, but Bulk and Phenomenus signed on for one more season. Kind of, we'll get into it later. As such, there won't be very much, if any, analysis of their character development this season, since Bulk and Skull worked better as a pair and Really, their characters capped off their run last time at the height of awesomeness. Though it does bug me that they just forgot Skull. Fortunately, unlike the early seasons, having the characters around for only one season from here on out means that we actually get character development and change for the Rangers, as opposed to mostly being bland goody goods. We meet Leo, Mike's brother, as he's tossed out of the spaceport for not having a passport to TerraVenture. One wonders why the hell the families of those serving on TerraVenture aren't coming with them, since Stanton makes it clear that they're not coming back to Earth. Take a good long look. Odds are you'll never see her again. Leo fights off a group of muggers who try to steal an old lady's passport, tricking them into thinking they got it. When she says that Terra Venture needs people like him, he decides to sneak onto the last shuttle headed for the colony. Leo is spotted by security, and he has to make a run for it, colliding right into Kendricks and Terra Venture's communications officer, Kai Chen. Kendricks covers for him for a moment as he steals a military uniform to try to blend in. Turns out the military uniforms are actually the mobile infantry armor from Starship Troopers. Those costumes ended up in a lot of other sci-fi movies, either repainted or just used outright like here. Then again, the villains for the season are insects, so I guess it's fitting. Anyway, he's accidentally roped into a training exercise on the moon, which, as we've established, has regular gravity and a breathable atmosphere. Also, since this is a training exercise with live ammunition and explosives, naturally, they take off their helmets. Yet in Starship Troopers, when that happened, someone got a bullet in their brain. But hey, remember kids, service as a Power Ranger guarantees guarantees citizenship. Mike runs into the group and reveals to Kendricks and Kai that Leo is his brother. Back on the alien world, called Miranoi, one of the natives named Maya is on the run from the Stingwingers. Somehow, the laser eyes from the Stingwingers open up a plot hole that sends Maya to the moon. The Stingwingers come through as well, but the four fight them off. Maya explains about Furio attacking, and they all decide to go. Except for Kai, who's actually being rather sensible. They have no idea what's on the other side of the portal, and Terra Venture won't wait for them. Mike also doesn't want Leo to go, but he runs through anyway, ending the first part of the episode. Kai, remembering the words of the captain... Remember, never, ever leave a team member behind. 
sees a flyer for the Astro Megaship, which has been converted into a museum since the end of In Space. I do have to kind of tilt my head at this, since it seems like it would be the property of KO-35, but I guess the Space Rangers donated it to science, since... Well, they did kind of atomize every evil force left in the universe with Zordon's little destructo wave. One of the problems with Terra Venture looking exactly like a regular city inside of it is that it's not clear whether the ship is parked inside of Terra Venture or on Earth itself. It has to have been inside of Terra Venture, since otherwise Kai would have had to go back to Earth to go get it, and that would have probably taken a while. But why this museum to such a pivotal time in Earth's history would be allowed to go on the journey that's not coming back to Earth isn't really obvious. Kai clears the mega ship save for Alpha 6 and its mechanic named Damon Henderson. I know this ship inside and out. So believe me when I tell you, this is a museum, not a spaceship. Yeah, thanks Damon. Ever heard of the Astro Megazord? It hasn't been that long since the Rangers saved the Earth. And if it's not a spaceship, what does it even need a mechanic for? After Kai almost futzes up the ship, Damon comes back and helps them get underway. One wonders why Alpha's having more trouble flying the thing than the guy who claimed that the megaship couldn't fly at all. There's also somehow another portal in space that leads the megaship to Miranoi, and Kai just knows that's there, I guess. Furio threatens the old sage who is expositing about the Quasar Sabres, but he responds with bad action. You never release them. You were chosen. The four arrive to confront Furio, aided by Kai and Damon, who just kind of wander onto the set. One wonders where they parked the mega ship and why the mechanic decided to join them. The six put up a good fight, but they're obviously outgunned by Furio and the Stingwingers. Mike, when cornered at the Quasar Sabers, pulls one out and knocks Furio back. Everyone but Leo takes a saber, much to the shock of the planet's inhabitants. Furio uses his powers to turn everyone around them into a Photoshop filter, I mean, turn them to stone. As the Rangers flee, Mike falls into a crevice that Furio creates. Leo tries to pull him up, but Mike hands him the Quasar Saber instead. He gets off some parting words before falling into the crevice, which closes up some how. Wait, I never even met Mike! Who the hell is he? The five regroup and the Quasar Sabres start glowing. They hold up the Sabres as lightning strikes them, morphing the five into the Galaxy Rangers. With their new powers, the five easily manage to dispatch the Stingwingers. The Rangers are forced into retreat as the Photoshop filter catches up with them, the Stingwingers in pursuit. Leo is clearly pissed that they have to go, especially since they're leaving Mike behind. They get back into the Astro Megaship and take off, Alpha ecstatic that there are new Rangers, but doesn't really question any of it. The Megaship takes off as they watch Miranoi get engulfed in the effect. The Rangers make it through the portal and and Maya makes a little speech. The Quasar Sabres were put in that rock 3,000 years ago. We've been given an unbelievable opportunity and responsibility to be Power Rangers. However, Leo is still sad because of the loss of Mike. Plus, it doesn't help that it's clear that the Quasar Saber wasn't meant for him. The Astro Megaship lands back on Terra Venture, apparently no one noticing the hangar bay opening or shutting whenever the ship travels, as it begins its quest for a new world. Back with Furio, he reports to his leader, Scorpius, whose ship travels through the portal in pursuit of the Rangers. Quasar Quest is pretty strong, establishing Leo's characterization as a headstrong and impulsive, and setting up minor bits of characterization for the rest. Kendrix's sweet and caring nature Nature, as well as her intelligence, since she's a scientist, Kai's desire to play by the rules until his teammates are in danger, Damon's mechanical knowledge, and Maya's ancient knowledge of the Quasar Sabres. There are a number of holes in the story, from the inexplicable portals that are now everywhere, to who these new villains are, since all evil forces in the universe were supposed to have been wiped out, but they don't hurt the story that much. Like in space, there's no mentor, but we get to see traits from each person that show that they're worthy to be rangers. Say for Damon, but hey, he does ultimately decide to come fly the megaship and help them out. The galaxy costumes have been lovingly nicknamed the Charlie Brown costumes because of the squiggly line in the front. And frankly, these suits leave a lot to be desired, in my opinion. I think the big problem is the torso. White is a more predominant color on all these uniforms instead of the Rangers' own colors, and it's the first thing that draws the eye. Unlike previous series, the Rangers' Zords are actual living beings. The Galacta Beasts, five gigantic animals that the group rescues from Scorpius. Why the hell they transform into robots is never explained, but then again, this is Power Rangers, where we can breathe on the moon. Scorpius actually launches an attack on Terra Venture, and for the first time ever, we see an organized military force attempting to fight a monster.
huh. Guess that explains why they always expect the Rangers to do it for them. Something that does bug me about the seasons, starting with In Space, and especially here, is how they stopped using Ron Wasserman's music or any other tunes with actual lyrics during the fight scenes. According to Wasserman, after he had left Saban in 1995, he did some occasional work for the show, but apparently over time, the newer composers didn't want him around because they kept getting their work compared to him, which... Yeah, that's gotta be frustrating, but it is a shame since, well, his music is that good. The MIDI synth chord stuff didn't exactly set the world on fire in Power Rangers in Space, but it went with them attempting something different, and they still had a few tunes to call on, and at times it was actually pretty good, especially in Countdown to Destruction. Watching a fight in Lost Galaxy, though, it doesn't have quite the same impact, and it feels like it's a completely different sort of show, which I suppose it is at this point. In the in the original version of this video, I referred to this kind of thing as the Wasserman Factor. The fight might be action-packed and fun to look at, but without the right musical score, it doesn't have the same impact. Now over time, the music does improve significantly again, but stuff like music with lyrics for fight scenes never happened again on the show, and I admit I miss it. As the early episodes progressed, we're introduced to Scorpius's daughter, Trakina. Trakina is great in these early episodes. Sly, scheming, and she doesn't do very much. You get the impression she's a real power to contend with, but prefers to stay in the background and not attract too much attention. And of course, the Rangers got their own assemblage of weapons for new toys, including the Jet Jammers, flying vehicles that they can use both in space and in the air. Alpha and Decca built them, which makes sense. They're very reminiscent of the galaxy glider from in space. They also obtain the trans daggers, which unfold into their individual weapons and also transform the Galacta beasts into their robot modes. I still don't get that. However, the major upgrade to the group's arsenal came in the Lights of Orion saga. Trakina informs Furio that Scorpius has run out of patience with him, but he convinces her to tell him to give him more time, since he's discovered the location of the Lights of Orion, an extraordinary energy source. They can't gain entrance to the cave where the lights are because they weren't chosen, but Furio says that he knows who was chosen. After an encounter with the Rangers, Furio reveals that he still has Mike, who's alive. Leo chases after them, and the others catch up, stopping him before he rushes in on his own. While they provide a distraction, Leo goes in and grabs Mike, who explains about the lights of Orion and that they have to get them before Furio does. It's a trap! Yeah, it's an obvious trap, but it does play to Leo's character growth. He's rash, emotional, and impulsive. He doesn't think before he does something, and, as a result, makes ton of obvious mistakes. Leo gets inside the cave into the lights, but Mike knocks him down and takes the lights, revealing him himself to be a monster in disguise. Though I've got to say, I was shocked when I heard the monster's voice. <laughs> Yeah, I know, Robert Axelrod, who voiced Lord Zed, also did the voices on numerous monsters, as well as Finster, but doing the Zed laugh for someone who isn't Zed... It's rather disappointing. Furio manages to get the box with the lights in it, but when he opens it up, it's empty. Furio is granted one last chance thanks to Trakina's intervention, though why she intervenes on his behalf, I'm not sure. And of course, in truly bad writing fashion, Furio is given multiple chances, despite that whole one last chance thing. Apparently behind the scenes, the Lights of Orion saga was a nightmare. Production was behind schedule, and one episode hadn't even finished shooting a few days before it was set to air. Scripts were frequently rewritten or hadn't gone past a first draft before shooting began, and as a result, not everything made much sense. And again, it already doesn't make much sense, since what the hell are these legendary lights doing on Terra Venture? I doubt they completely cut out a section of the Earth that happened to have the Cave of the Lights of Orion in them and just dropped it into Terra Venture. The colony might have had dirt and forests planted within it, but it's not like they just took a cave and shoved it in a dome. At the end of a filler episode, of the saga, Scorpius finally has enough and tries to destroy Furio. He escapes, conveniently locating the lights of Orion in a cave he retreats to. Really sends a bad message to future managers. Motivate your employees to complete their tasks by threatening to murder them. It gets results! Leo happens upon the cave and the two fight, Furio self-destructing to try to kill him. Can't say I'm gonna miss Furio either. He was like a low-rent Goldar, and Goldar at least had a certain charm to him. Leo is rescued by a mysterious man in armor known as the 
Magna Defender. For some reason, Leo is at first under the impression that the Magna Defender is Mike. He is pretty badass, with a fully armored look as well as a gun that becomes a sword, and as I've established, guns that become swords are awesome. The Magna Defender also was apparently involved in the conflict 3,000 years ago when the Quasar Sabers were originally put in the rocks. The character filled the sixth Ranger slot, despite the speculation among fans about whether or not he counts as an actual Ranger. Since he's not in spandex and he doesn't have Ranger in his name, though later he does have a morpher. I will say that I don't consider him a Ranger because of the lack of Ranger in his name, plus how different his design is from the others of the team. Aspects that will be my go-to definition for future characters like him. Plus, since Masked Rider is a part of Power Rangers canon, we can probably say there's precedent for morphing not being a necessity for Ranger status. That one can change forms without being specifically tied to the team's powers. Unlike previous Sixth Rangers, though, he's completely independent and wants nothing to do with them, also caring nothing for innocent lives. Why do you want the lights of Orion? I have my reasons. <laughs> And we actually find out that it's because Scorpius killed his son back in the original conflict 3,000 years ago. Damn, this is the first time in the series we had an on-screen child death. He's also got his own Zord, the Toro Zord, that he actually grows and merges with for fights. Anyway, Trakina sadly became a bit more annoying, simply wanting to leave her father's ship. Now, I don't mind that as a character motivation, but she was so much more sly when she first appeared, and as time goes on, her behavior sadly degenerated into near de Divatox levels of whininess. As the Lights of Orion saga came to a close, the Magna Defender started to collapse in pain for an unknown reason. The saga finally ends with the Lights coming to the Rangers and giving them enhanced weapons and upgrades to the Quasar Sabers. The saga itself was pretty dull, mostly filler episodes, saved only by the Magna Defender bits and the excitement that comes once the Lights actually come to the Rangers, as brief a sequence as it is. There was a subplot going on with the next general after Furio named Treacheron, but it's not really significant. What was of note about it is that it brought up the idea that despite the forces of evil rejecting goodness... Red Ranger, you stand for everything I hate. Goodness, honesty, decency. ...that the forces still exhibited loyalty and honor to their leaders. Considering the guy's name is Treacheron, you wouldn't really expect him to be super loyal, but he is, and his monsters in particular are all honored to work for him and be especially loyal to him, sometimes exhibiting horror that he's harmed. After an incident where Leo saves the Magna Defender, despite the Defender trying to destroy the Mountain Dome of Terra Venture in an effort to destroy Scorpius, we learned that when Mike fell into the crevice, the Magna Defender found him and, weakened after 3,000 years, years, took hold of Mike's spirit so he could survive. However, the bonding isn't stable, and it's tearing him apart. He says that the only way Mike will survive is if Leo destroys him. Leo refuses to destroy the Magna Defender, even though he's insisting on it. Eventually, the Magna Defender sacrifices himself to stop the damage he had wrought on the Mountain Dome, saving TerraVenture and setting Mike free. With Mike back, Leo's character underwent a shift. Partially it was inspired due to the fact that it was Mike who originally pulled the saber out, not him. Once he got that confidence boost, he wasn't as impulsive as before. The Magnet Defender's powers passed on to Mike, which, as I said, he changed by using a morpher, though that begs the question of whether the original Magna Defender had a form outside of his armored look. The Magna Defender Morpher is kinda confusing, since you have to pull out the key for it on one side and then plug it into the other side. It's kinda reminiscent of the Xeonizers, but it's just odd that you have to pull out the one section first. Speaking of, the Galaxy Morphers are kinda disappointing. They just tap them and they morph just not as cool as the previous morphers. This is a change from how the Sentai did it, where there's actually a dial on them that specifies which color they change into, albeit now it makes me wonder if they could all theoretically change into the same color using that. In an absolutely idiotic episode called Stolen Beauty, 17 episodes in, we finally catch up with Bulk and Professor Phenomenus. Turns out they were assigned to the scientific division. But they're obviously not ready for intelligence of our caliber. We got canned. And now they run a bar. 
And isn't that just fitting for Bulk? After all, he spent the last few years hanging out at the juice bar and getting splattered with food. I could see him wanting to get into a business like that. The running a bar part. I don't think you can make a career out of getting hit in the face with food. Uh, unless you're the comic relief on a children's show. The episode's other significance is that Scorpius wants Drakina to enter a cocoon that would shed her of her more humanoid characteristics and make her fully become an insect. She refuses, since she doesn't want to lose her beauty, but I'm guessing that this is why Scorpius, up until this point, has been reluctant to have her in combat. She's not nearly powerful enough until she undergoes the metamorphosis. During an absolutely stunning filler episode called The Rescue Mission, which is essentially an aliens ripoff, but for a kid's show it's pretty spectacular, the team finds an ancient book and a derelict ship clutched in the hands of its dead captain. The story continues in The Lost Galacta Beasts. While Trakina is away, a new general finds his way onto Scorpius' ship. Deviat. He strives to prove himself to Scorpius, hoping to enter the cocoon as the new second-in-command by unleashing three zords that he has control over. So I guess the cocoon isn't locked specifically to Trakina. It's some kind of method of upgrading someone using insectoid characteristics. It's just it would discard some of the more humanoid parts of her as a result. While analyzing the book they found, Kendrix discovers a section that features the Galacta Beasts, as well as a broken off part that includes three more Galacta Beasts. Deviat is a badass and manages to beat up Damon and Kai and take them to another planet. Using remote control collars, he has the two fight each other, draining the energy they expend in fighting to power his zords. This brings up a question commonly asked about the show. Why do sparks always blast out of the rangers when they get hit or they hit something? From a meta perspective, it's just less violent to have sparks than blood fly when slashing at things with swords and guns. But in universe, my personal theory is that anytime their suits are struck, the power overloads briefly, kind of like sending too much power through Christmas tree lights. It causes a power surge. The other rangers head out looking for them while the two manage to escape. The other rangers rescue them, and they all attack Deviat. And here's where I think my theory has some backing to it, as all the sparking and energy that comes from their attack is drained into the remote control for the Zords under his control, named Stratoforce and Centaurus, along with the Zenith Carrier Zord, giving him the rest of the power he requires. The Galaxy Megazord refuses to fight Deviat Zord, since I'm sure anyone with a functioning brain has figured out that Deviat Zords are the missing Galacta Beasts. Eventually, they manage to free the Zords from Deviat's control and join forces with the Rangers. With his failure, Deviat decides that if he can't enter the cocoon, he'll just destroy Scorpius to get it. Which doesn't sound like such a bad idea. I guess that's one way of saying take this job and shove it. Maybe his true calling was actually in pest control. Deviat tricks Scorpius into believing that the Rangers are holding Trakina hostage. Enraged at the prospect of the Rangers taking her, Scorpius decides to finally just destroy the Rangers himself. Scorpius, despite being pretty immobile, is actually pretty effective with his tentacles, simply tossing around the Rangers without much difficulty. However, they eventually manage to use the lights of Orion to mortally wound him. And unlike the Machine Empire, Scorpius won't be returning. This is the first time the main villain has ever been completely defeated halfway through the show, opening up new possibilities, as we soon see. Trakina, meanwhile, has been wandering around on her own and arrives at the old West Bar Andros and Darkonda were at on the planet Onyx. She's aided by two beings named Villamax and his associate, Kegler. After Trakina explains her situation, Villamax volunteers to train her to become a warrior. We even get a training montage that's just begging for an 80s tune. As such, I shall supply one. The training eventually starts to work, and Trakina is able to fight off Villamax. I like Villamax. He kind of reminds me of a Clipter, especially in his support and loyalty to Trakina. He's a self-proclaimed noble warrior, and he actually does live up to that, even if he's on the side of the bad guys. For example, in the next episode, he promises the freedom of the other rangers if Leo surrenders to him, and, much to Deviat's shock, actually does so. Upon hearing of what happened to her father, Trakina returns before Deviat can enter the cocoon and the two bid farewell. It's definitely more complex stuff than we usually got from Power Rangers, showing that the two did love each other despite being evil. It is me who is sorry. I should have never tried to keep you so sheltered. Almost makes you forget that one of them is wearing a bug on her head, and the other is a slobbering tentacle hentai monster. As Scorpius evaporates, his last tentacle transforms into Trakina's new staff. It 
Wait, is that how Zed got his staff? His mom was a giant gorgon or something, had snakes for hair. She died, and one of the snakes became the staff. Anyway, the cocoon is locked away for safekeeping by Kegler. To Deviat's annoyance. Drakina becomes seriously badass in her fighting skills after this. She does sadly have the bad habit of scene chewing, but I can forgive that since her fighting prowess makes up for it. When you destroyed Scorpius, you created something even more powerful. Me. She's not as powerful as her father, but being able to take on the rangers in a proper fight helps even the odds. Especially considering Scorpius didn't really move a lot in his fights by comparison. Plus, you know, being hammy is kind of a prerequisite for this show. However, the real highlight of the season arrives in To the Tenth Power. Deviat meets with an alien and obtains a chest containing five very familiar looking data cards. When the alien tries to double cross him, Deviat kills them and returns to the Scorpion Stinger. He explains that he's reprogrammed the cards to be even stronger than they were before and inserts them into a digital reader, reconstituting them into... Back on the alien world, another familiar looking robed figure finds the remains of the alien and the empty box. The psychos at first have no desire to work for Trakina, their obsessive need to fight their respective rangers sticking with them. However, Trakina helps keep them in line with devices attached to their arms that cause pain if they disobey. The psychos get to work kidnapping four of the five rangers while in their civilian identities pretty easily. Pink and blue do face their counterparts with an actual fight, but it really highlights the strength difference. Kai just getting tossed around and Kendrick's beaten up. Oh man, look how much damage this fight is doing to the empty box factory! Leo faces off against Psycho Red and does manage to morph, but Psycho Red is too much for him, even forcing him to demorph during the fight. However, the figure in the cloak arrives and rescues Leo, shooting Psycho Red with a familiar looking blaster. After they get away, the cloaked figure takes off his hood, revealing Legolas! You're Andros. I was there. The day you and the Rangers saved the Earth. To the Tenth Power is the first of the annual Ranger team-ups. With each season being mostly standalone from now on, getting to see the past team creates both a sense of continuity, as well as an informal acknowledgement that these Rangers are worthy of being Rangers, even if it's usually three-fourths of the way through the season, so by that point they probably already have proven themselves. Some seasons, for one reason or another, didn't have team-ups, but when they did happen, it was cool to see two teams together, even if the episode itself wasn't very good. The two head to the megaship, Andros reuniting with Alpha. They locate the Rangers, and Andros goes into the Power Vault, where he and the other Rangers kept their morphers. Never thought I'd be needing this again. Yeah, it seems like Zordon was kind of talking out of his... Well, I was gonna say ass, but giant floating head. Anyway, talking out of his nostrils when he said all evil in the universe would be destroyed. The two lead the psychos outside while Mike sneaks in and frees the other rangers. Meanwhile, back on the megaship, the power vault reopens and the other morphers are taken. The galaxy rangers are cornered by the psychos until the arrival of some old friends. <laughs> I can't show it because of content ID, but one part of the team-up that's always fun when it happens is hearing the theme songs flow into each other when the two teams morph. Later on, this would sometimes get dropped, a disappointment to be sure, but this time right here is one of the best examples. In Space's theme song just goes into Lost Galaxies pretty well. Oh, and we also get the other staple of the annual team-up, the explosions behind them after they morph. Yes, it's silly, but like the sparks thing, my theory is that so much power concentrated in one spot causes an overload. In the pavement, I guess. Or maybe it's coming from their feet. Oh, who the hell cares? It just looks cool. Anyway, the fights here are phenomenal, showcasing a number of different fighting techniques. The stunt work is fantastic, and the rangers all really come off as competent fighters, especially when you consider that they're managing to fight off the psychos so well. It really shows that despite how strong the psychos were last season, and even with their enhancements, they're no match for two battle-hardened ranger teams. Another reason why this is such a great team-up, anytime there's a crossover in, say, comic books, there's a risk that one team or hero will overshadow the other, questioning the competence or effectiveness of the other. With this team up, the two groups complement each other really well, working together really effectively, and the individual fights with the villains show how in sync the two teams are. 
Just amazingly good fight choreography. Also, Zane isn't around for some reason, probably just making out with Corone somewhere. Using the lights of Orion and the Space Ranger's weapons, they appear to destroy the Psychos. Turns out Alpha was the one to call in the others, and given what we see next episode, it's probable that they used the Nasada shuttle in order to reach TerraVenture, though it is kind of a big plot hole about how fast the thing needs to be to catch up with the colony. The Space Rangers decide to stick around and get a tour of TerraVenture, though they do say they need to head back to Earth. Why exactly is never said, though it's likely that the far farther they get from Earth, the harder it'll be to return. I do wish the group had said hi to Bulk during this. After all, he knows they're Rangers, and it would have given him a fun and funny moment too, instead of not seeing him again for a long while after this. However, amidst the remains of the Psychos and the rubble, Psycho Pink crawls out, Deviat taking her to heal her injuries. It's immediately followed up by The Power of Pink, wherein Psycho Pink rips off the control device on her arm, saying she only cares about destroying the Pink Ranger and not any of the others. She tries to kill Trakina, but Villamax saves her with one quick move of his sword. She runs off, Trakina deciding to let her go and do some damage. Psycho Pink, using the same kind of possession ability that we saw with Psycho Yellow last season, travels along Terra Ventures' computer network until she ends up in Kendrix's computer. Kendrix has used the Galaxy Book to locate an ancient sword weapon before Psycho Pink reaches out of the computer and drains some of Kendrix's mind like last season. Kendrix and Cassie chase after her as she leaves TerraVenture, heading for the planet where the sword is located. They contact the other rangers, but a group of Stingwingers comes in to distract them and keep them from helping. Psycho Pink finds the sword embedded in stone like the Quasar Sabers and is able to pull it out, fighting the two pink rangers. The sword grows larger with every blow... So I guess you have an explanation for why Cloud Sword in Final Fantasy VII is so friggin' huge. Cassie is forced to power down and her morpher gets separated from her. Psycho Pink smashes the morpher, draining the power from it and creating an energy cyclone originating from it. Damn, the Space Ranger powers have a lot of juice running through them. In future seasons when morphers get smashed, they just break. This thing causes natural disasters. Psycho Pink reverts to her monster form as she gains more energy, the cloud growing tall enough to affect Terra Venture. Cassie is weakened thanks to her damaged morpher, and Psycho Pink grows giant-sized, the Galaxy Megazord arriving to stop her. The Space Rangers form the Astro Megazord to help. As I said, I think the Space Rangers took the shuttle to get to TerraVenture, which would explain why the Galaxy Rangers never tried to form the Astro Megazord before. Without the shuttle, the thing doesn't work. It's not exactly a long, knockout brawl, but it's nice to see the two Megazords working together in American footage. They defeat Psycho Pink, but the Cyclone is still going. With Cassie continually in pain, Kendrix takes out her Quasar Saber and goes into the Energy Cyclone, despite it continually harming and blasting her. Kendrix finally reaches the Morpher in the eye of the cyclone. You know, I'm tired of this false drama. Everyone telling her to get out of there and all that. We all know what's gonna happen. She's gonna destroy the sword and we'll see her fine just a minute later. They'll talk about friendship and then... I'm okay. I'll always be here. So, um... Yeah. Kendrix is dead. Didn't call that one. Cassie's Morpher repairs itself, and the two groups say farewell. Kendrix's Quasar Saber flying off to parts unknown. Yeah, that's a pretty sad way to end the team up. Still, the two teams leave on good terms. Valerie Vernon, who played Kendrix, was sadly diagnosed with leukemia and had to leave the series to undergo treatment. Fortunately, the treatments were successful, and she's now leukemia-free. The plan was for Patricia Jolly, who played Cassie, to become the new Pink Galaxy Ranger possibly in universe out of guilt for her more for causing Kendrix's death, but apparently there was a pay issue. Valerie Vernon was going to keep being paid as a full cast member. One thing I read was that it was deliberate so that she could use the funds to pay for her treatment. Another that to not do so would have violated her contract and they would have gotten sued. Might be both or neither. But Patricia was only going to be paid at a guest star wage for the remaining 13 episodes of the season. As such, the ending to Power of Pink was reshot, so the Rangers said their goodbyes in full uniform to hide their absence. Absence, and they went in a different direction, though still a good direction for it. It is a shame, though, that we lost out on Patricia being the new Pink Galaxy Ranger, since there was at least one full completed script ready, where she has to stop the villains from stealing the Astro Megaship in what was apparently a kid-friendly version of Die Hard. And that just conjures up the image of a Stingwinger beaten up, delivered in an elevator to Trakina with a sign on it that reads, Now I have a Quasar Saber. Ho, ho, ho. Weirdly, one would think that they could still adapt the script 
setup to another character in the role and just produce the episode later, but whatever. Instead, another In Space alumni was chosen to be the new Pink Galaxy Ranger. The Quasar Saber lands on another alien planet. Kendrix, in a dream, tells Maya where the Saber is and instructs her to protect it. Maya's been having dream visions during the entire season, but I'll get into it a bit more when I analyze the characters. Deviat leads the Rangers on a wild goose chase for it while he goes after the real location of the Saber. The same Wild West bar as before. Weird. At an auction for weapons, various monsters bid for it, until one person in particular announces her presence. One million! Astronomer. However, Trakina is also at the bar and reveals the fact that Astronema is really Corone. Corone fights her way out of the bar and gets away, showing that she's obviously been training a bit in the intervening time. Still, probably should have kept her staff, that would have been helpful. She travels to the other rangers and they make their way to the jet jammers, but Trakina intercepts them. Corone takes the saber and fights the villain, getting knocked off a cliff. She saves herself, but only has a tenuous grip on the rock face. However, as she drops, Kendrix's spirit appears to Corone, giving her the pink transmorpher and brings her back up. She retrieves the saber and morphs. So, Corone is a Power Ranger now. I wouldn't want to be a Power Ranger anyway. In the next episode, we see a little bit more follow-up on Corone's time as Astronema, with her lamenting her lost childhood. After a fight where Leo's ranger powers are drained and his morpher damaged, she talks about a time as Astronema when she fought a warrior with two keys that, when combined, granted him awesome power. She froze him in stone before he could finish combining them, and his power might be enough to replenish Leo's. The two arrive at the cave of the warrior where we see... this. Astronema! You struck down the warrior and dare to return! Holy crap, army of darkness! Um, anyway, in order to pass through, Corone has to face herself as Astronema. Heh, <laughs> told her she should have kept the staff. Wait, what family member died to give Astronema her staff? When she offers to sacrifice herself to save Leo, she's allowed to enter. Seriously, talking and moving skeletons and Power Rangers is just creepy. Anyway, they go into the cave, but the warrior doesn't have the keys anymore. Corone apologizes for what she did as Astronema, and her tears hit the warrior, freeing him from the stone curse. Is that just a trait of KO-35's people? Their tears have magical healing properties? Is it like the telekinesis? What the hell? The warrior gives them the keys, not just restoring Leo's powers, but granting him his battleizer mode too. Like the last one, his battleizer mode looks absolutely ridiculous. I think the thing that just makes me laugh the most is the boots. The rest of it I wouldn't have that much of a problem with as a toy to buy, but the little armored feet serve no purpose and just weigh him down when he's moving. It's like when a little kid puts big cardboard boxes on their feet and tries to move with them. I should note that technically it isn't called a battleizer in the series itself, but it's technically dubbed battleizer armor due to its use in the franchise. I suppose those of you at home are wondering why the hell this show is called Lost Galaxy. Well, it seems the creators were frequently tossing around ideas for the concept of the show, one of which was the idea of ancient rangers, but for various reasons the idea was scrapped. So the only real explanation from the producers for why the Quasar Sabers is in the rock is Zordon put them there, which appeared in one of the earliest versions of the first episode script, as well as putting the Rangers into a lost galaxy to really push the team to their limits. So with the production difficulties the show was having throughout its run, the titular lost galaxy doesn't actually happen until the 35th episode, beginning with Enter the Lost Galaxy. Huh, I wonder if they enter the Lost Galaxy. One night, while the scientists are studying the Galaxy Book, they recite certain words in it that causes the book to suddenly short-circuit the colony's systems. At the same time, a mysterious man lands on Terra Venture and heads straight for the Galaxy Book, which has been locked up after the aforementioned short-circuiting. Security stops the guy before he can get to the book. The man tells Kai that he's the guardian of the book, and that it was stolen centuries ago, and that they need to get the book away before it does any damage. Given how reciting some passages from it caused some damage, maybe Maybe this thing is actually the Necronomicon Ex Mortis? We did see a talking skeleton a couple episodes ago. 
Kai, convinced of the man's sincerity, decides to help him. I'll get into this a bit more when we analyze Kai's character arc at the end. Deviat intercepts Kai before he can get the book to him. The Guardian, weakened by the atmosphere, is killed by Deviat. Deviat reads from the book, finishing the incantation and giving himself more power. After smacking around the rangers a bit, Deviat grows and it takes all the Zords to defeat him, though it doesn't kill him. The mystic energies of the book transport Terra Venture into the Lost Galaxy. The place screws with Terra Venture immensely, causing time anomalies, and the crew can't navigate with no known stars to move by. A space pirate ship led by the monster Captain Mutiny detects Terra Venture and heads toward them. What kind of vessel? Well, it's a castle sitting on a dinosaur flying towards us. Say what you will about Captain Mutiny, he knows how to travel. Captain Mutiny comes aboard with his Pirates of Penzance rejects and explains that every hundred years or so, a vessel ends up in the Lost Galaxy, but that he has a machine that can send them back. Naturally, the Rangers don't trust it, but Stanton decides to send a ship to Mutiny's planet to check it out anyway. While the Terra Ventures soldiers head back to the colony, the Rangers stay to check on Captain Mutiny and get more information. They discover that Mutiny captures ship crews to be his mining slaves, and that whatever is the box that was left for them is meant to capture Terra Venture's crew. They fight a monster and defeat it before heading back, but Deviat suddenly shows up and drains what remains of the monster's power, returning to normal. The box, in turn, actually contains a monster that burrows into the ship. Deviat comes to Captain Mutiny and starts working for him, helping to enhance the monster's power. After a particularly tough battle, the Rangers manage to combine the strength of their Zords and defeat the monster. After a clip show episode, there are two filler episodes involving a monster named Hexuba that are barely worth mentioning. However, the important part is that at the end of the second, Commander Stanton reveals that their fuel reserves have been tainted and that they have only one or two days left before they run out of fuel and the ship is without power. We see this affecting them in the next episode as one of the engines blows out. In Escape the Lost Galaxy, Mike gets into the slave camp to try to free the rest of the people, while Kai locates the spell that brought Terra Venture to the Lost Galaxy. They open a portal and Terra Venture sets course for it while Mike frees the slaves. The Rangers arriving in the megaship to help get everyone out. Mutiny chases after the megaship as Mike sacrifices the Torazor to keep the portal open long enough for Terra Venture to return home. Mutiny's castle passes through the portal as well, intent on conquering this new galaxy, but... There's only one ruler in this universe. That's me. Yo ho, yo ho, a pirate's death for me. He went out like a true pirate, murdered by a bug woman in her spaceship. Leo finds Mike, who's floating in the vacuum of space. Unmorphed. And yet he's still alive. Power Rangers takes science and beats it with an aluminum bat. Still, he survives, but the Magna Defender Morpher is trashed beyond repair. The Lost Galaxy saga really just comes off like wasted potential. It got off to a great start, introducing the team to a dangerous new situation, but petered out pretty quickly into filler. Captain Mutiny wasn't nearly as interesting as the villains we had already had, though at least he came off as a pirate. Still, the problem when you go from powerful evil monarch to pirate is a loss of scope, as we saw with Divatox, so it was good that he didn't stick around after they returned to the regular galaxy. Due to a lot of the production and rewrite issues, they were never able to explore the backstory of the galaxy powers and what had happened 3,000 years prior that had caused the Quasar Sabers to be embedded in the rocks to begin with. But like I said, they weren't exactly planning on doing much with it anyway. Isn't it fun when the title of your series is kind of a lie? The series comes to a close in the three-parter Journey's End. Deviat returns to the Scorpion Stinger, claiming to have been kidnapped by Captain Mutiny and forced to work with him. But Trakina doesn't buy it and orders Villamax to destroy him. Deviat flees down to the cocoon, planning to enter it and rejuvenate himself. However, Trakina and Villamax intervene. Deviat grabs Trakina and leaps into the cocoon, the two merging together inside of it. Trakina leaves the cocoon with a distortion in her voice like Deviat's and small modifications to her appearance, like darker eyes. Terra Venture's in bad shape, with only one engine left, and they decide they need to land somewhere. They've located a nearby world for this and make preparations. There are some good moments here, like the dome's shields coming down, and we see the actual sky, as well as the sun coming up over the new world. Maya even says how sad she is that Kendrix isn't there to see it. However, the Scorpion Stinger arrives, and Trakina launches a direct attack. Welcome back. 
Terraventure. Leo and Damon swipe some explosives as the Scorpion Stinger destroys the last of the colony's engines. As Damon distracts the Scorpion Stinger, Leo plants the explosives on the ship, forcing the villains to withdraw for the moment. However, the loss of the engine means the colony can't navigate, and it crashes into one of the planet's moons instead. To make matters worse, the colony's dome starts to crack. What's left of the colony has to evacuate if they have any hope of survival. Trakina attaches bombs to every single one of the Stingwingers, much to Villa Max's dismay. Trakina, please. We can destroy the Rangers without destroying our own soldiers. Say it! The first part of the finale comes to a close with Trakina riding atop the Scorpion Stinger as her suicide bombers approach the colony. The Stratoforce and Centaurus Zords are sent out to try to deal with the Stingwingers, but plenty of them get inside. We even get glimpses of Bulk and Phenomenus fleeing, the first time we've seen them in like 25 episodes. Villamax is still pissed at the idea of destroying their whole army, then spots a little girl in the wreckage. He protects her from the falling rubble. Welcome. The Zords are finally overrun, and the Stingwingers detonate, blowing up the two. The Rangers, thanks to their extensive arsenal and some tricks, are able to fend off the remaining Stingwingers and help with the evacuation of Terra Venture to the planet via shuttles. Commander Stanton observes the situation and manages to get in some Star Trek-esque pathos. The city was going to be the shining capital of the new world. Instead, it's a shipwreck. We also get some last bits of character development for Leo. Still glad you snuck on board. I'd do it again in a heartbeat. As the last group of shuttles heads towards the planet, the Scorpion Stinger approaches, Trakina saying they'll blast them out one by one. Villamax, however, refuses to fire on the defenseless shuttles, and Trakina starts shooting him, laughing in glee. However, he also refuses to fight a student, so Trakina just wails on him. You taught me to fight too well, it seems. You've learned nothing. I mean, you did notice that she merged with Deviant, right? I don't think this is entirely her fault, dude. Before Trakina can resume her assault, the Astro Megaship comes in, finally using its friggin' weapons! Sure, even if they can't use its Megazord mode, it's still a ship with weapons that could have helped with the ongoing defense. However, the Scorpion Stinger grabs the Megaship, which starts exploding. Leo says that the only way to stop Trakina is to initiate the Megaship's self-destruct. I've gotta say, this is a lot more heart-wrenching than losing Terra Venture. Sure, it was their home and all, but the Megaship helped save the entire universe. And they're losing Decca now, too. Sure, Decca wasn't exactly a main character or anything, but she still had a personality. It's like losing the command center in the power chamber. The loss of such a recognizable part of the show is like losing an old friend. Also, self-destruct is only like three or four buttons. Weird. They succeed, forcing the Scorpion Stinger to crash on the moon. Bulk and Phenomenus reach the new world. Maybe. <laughs> well, thanks for appearing, guys. You met like one or two members of the cast. Back on the moon, Leo's jet jammer has crashed as well, having been caught in the explosion. Trakina, with her ship damaged and herself partially injured, goes to the cocoon to complete her metamorphosis, ending part two. Once it finishes, Trakina emerges as an insect without any humanoid features. Leo, unable to contact the others, heads towards the Scorpion Stinger. As the humans start setting up a makeshift colony on the planet's surface, Trakina heads towards the wreckage of TerraVenture. Once there, she re-energizes the city, somehow lifting the dome off and sending it straight for the humans on the surface. Trakina's transformation has made her stronger and more agile, easily able to outfight Leo and sending him falling out of a skyscraper. He morphs and hits the ground, surviving the attack, but Trakina goes after him and the two begin their fight. The Rangers learn what's going on and head to the dome to try to stop her. They all reunite and fight her, but it goes about as well as you'd expect, the villainess tossing the five around like ragdolls. Leo summons his battleizer and grabs grabs Trakina, pulling her in and firing at point-blank range. The rangers arrive at the wreckage and he climbs out, his helmet damaged, but he gives the thumbs up. And I'm sure Trakina will never bother anyone again. The colony is still in danger though, but thankfully the Galaxy Megazord appears and slows the city down enough for it to miss the people and crash away from them. The Galactabeasts lead the rangers away and bring them, to their shock and amazement, to people frozen in stone. Yep, the world they've landed on is actually Miranoi, Maya's homeworld, and where their journey as rangers began. Well, hey, now with Corone here, she can cry on everybody and return them to normal. Our quest is complete. 
Maybe someday the next chosen warriors will free you. They return the sabers to the rock, the mystic energies of them restoring the people of Miranoi. However, even more surprisingly, Kendrix returns to life! How? Why? Because it's Power Rangers, where you can breathe in space. Hey, thanks for everything you've done. I wouldn't have missed it for the world. And so Power Rangers Lost Galaxy comes to a close. Like the last season, Lost Galaxy is a space opera. This one's different, of course, since it was able to tell its own story instead of serving as the potential end to all of Power Rangers. The Ranger powers and space bits could have used a lot more backstory. I really wish we had learned what exactly had happened 3,000 years ago and who it was who wielded the original galaxy powers. And of course, the lost galaxy that the entire series was supposed to be about ended up being just like regular space, but with more pirates. The season may not be part of the Zordon era, depending on who you ask, but it's at the very least an epilogue to it, taking the lessons learned from the past few seasons and showing that the Power Rangers' legacy was in good hands. We didn't need the same Rangers getting new powers. We could have new people take the roles. We could have continuity from the past, but we weren't bound by it, instead treating what came before with respect and reverence. They didn't need to be teenagers with attitude. They could be adults with their own arcs and imperfections and growth. They didn't even need a mentor. They made their own way, forged their own identity and path with the support of their friends and loved ones. Evil may still be around, but good will always rise to meet it. One of the advantages of the season being standalone is that the writers were allowed to give the characters a bit more personality, development, and change than what we got in previous series. In this case, I have thoughts about all these rangers, and since Bulk and Skull are no longer a part of the series, seriously, Bulk and Phenomenus were only in, like, three or four episodes out of 45, so why did they even bother? We'll instead use their time to talk about the Rangers' development. The one that got the most was Leo. As I said earlier, when he began, he was rash, impulsive, and didn't take the time to think about the situation or the consequences of his actions. By the end, he was less prone to leaping in without regard. Still, despite his previous behavior, he's still glad of most of the choices he's made and where they made him end up. His love for his brother and regret for his part in what he thought was his brother's death drove him forward, and Mike's later return brought about feelings of inadequacy for him, that he wasn't worthy of the role that was supposed to go to Mike. But he more than proved himself to be the right person to be the Red Ranger, being the one in the end to take down Trakina. Mike, when he started, was very protective of his brother and judgmental of the fact that he followed them on board. But after he joined with the Magna Defender, he really seemed to change, accepting of Leo's actions and more mellow with him around even preferring to bring him on official missions. He came off as more of a goody-good than the others in the team, though it was consistent since he freely walked into the portal to help Maya's people. However, the goody-good nature made for some well-written bits, like in the rescue mission, where the head honchos at Terra Venture say that it's too big a risk to launch a rescue mission for a distress call, that helping people isn't spelled out in their mission. But that's because it doesn't need to be spelled out. Helping should be second nature. It's a philosophy that I can definitely get behind, and one that I think Power Rangers best embodies. Kai began as a by-the-book officer through and through. The only time his behavior seemed to stray from what regulations told him was when Commander Stanton gave him advice. For example, when Stanton said to not leave anyone behind, that's when he decided to steal the megaship to rescue the others. In an episode called Blue to the Test, Stanton advised him to trust his instincts more often than the regulations. In that episode, it helped him save the ship, but we also saw that thought process process in action when he stole the Galaxy Book and freed the book's guardian. If there's a mentor this season, it's Stanton. But only to Kai, who needed to be taught that there's more to this kind of stuff than just following the rules. Kendricks didn't undergo a significant change, though her personality shined through most of the time. She was the scientist in the brain, but instead of that causing her to be nerdy and socially awkward like Billy had been, she was instead outgoing, trusting, and optimistic. It really shows off a selflessness in her character, that she didn't care about the consequences for herself, which helps explain why she made the sacrifice she did to try to save Cassie. Damon's a hard nut to crack. He clearly had a courageous spirit, to the point where during Facing the Past, he actually tackled a monster while unmorphed to give the others time to escape. However, he really came off as kind of a jerk sometimes, not caring about other people's problems, and instead worrying about getting something for himself. Still, his mechanical knowledge was invaluable, and, like I said, he's still pretty noble, and they don't really do much to highlight the fact that he's the most disconnected from the group until Corone joins, just the mechanic of the Astro Megaship who ends up on this journey because the ship needs 
to be commandeered. Maya's character was often bizarre to watch. She doesn't really undergo any change in her personality, but it's her personality itself that's baffling. Her entire world is encased in stone, everyone she knew and loved is as good as dead, and she's been whisked off in a spaceship to a place of unfamiliar technology and social customs, and she couldn't be happier! In fact, Miranoi rarely ever comes up in her conversation, and it never seems like she's sad for all the people trapped in stone, or concerned for their well-being. She really comes off as wasted potential a lot of the time. Sure, she was considerably helpful to the team by being able to communicate with the Galacta Beasts, and was in tune with nature and all that junk, but she could have also partially filled the mentor role, educating the rest of the group about the Quasar Sabers, the various powers and ancient forces they encounter, but instead she just has dreams where animals or energy sources or dead people talk to her and give her instructions. She's more a messenger pigeon than anything else. Still, like the others, she's heroic, and I suppose being happy-go-lucky has its upsides. I'm just saying it comes off as being in denial about her life. As the series progressed, there seemed to be a real sense of chivalry as a thematic element in the show. The amount of swordplay was one thing, but the theme of loyalty, especially among the forces of evil, seemed to be a major factor. Individual monsters and generals expressed fealty towards their leader far more than in previous series, with the exception of Ecliptor, though his loyalty was more about fatherly love. Most of the villains seemed more dedicated to a wider range of emotions and priorities than just straight-up evil. Kind of a microcosm of that is the episode Loyax's Last Battle, as an old evil warrior named Loyax wants one final honorable battle before he dies. Eventually, he faces off against Maya alone, wanting desperately to fight her. He reveals that he used to be good, but as the fight against evil wore on, it was clear to him that evil would eventually triumph, and he switched sides. Loyax is an old knight, still honorable in his heart, but unable to change in a universe that has outgrown him. He's sexist towards Maya, at first for being a girl, but still wants to fight her personally since she's a Power Ranger. It comes off less as overt misogyny, though obviously still present, but instead set in older ways of thinking. While the episode is more obviously just a filler about how we can still change no matter how old we are, it's also a nifty, if fast-paced character piece about an old warrior wanting one last chance for glory. The final shot of the episode is beautifully presented, with Maya sticking Loyax's sword in the sand, and the team walking off into the sunset the sword resembling a grave for the fallen warrior. However, that was simply a monster who used to be good. Consider also Treacheron, who, despite his name being, you know, treachery, was actually completely loyal to Scorpius and swore revenge on Turkina for betraying him. His monsters were fiercely loyal to him, and he never came off as cruel or unkind to his minions. He seemed to behave more like a samurai, wanting to prove himself as a warrior to Scorpius, and even challenged the Red Ranger in the middle of a larger battle to single combat. Villamax was an even better example of the chivalry present. Sure, he was still a dark warrior, but he remained true to his promises when he made them, and he was the one who recommended Loyax to Trakina, wanting to give an honorable warrior his due. He was a lot closer to Ecliptor in his ways. He was evil, but he had standards. It makes me all the more curious about his backstory, and how he developed into the way he is. As a Dark Knight, Kegler was his faithful squire, and he still protected the innocent. His quarrel was with the Rangers, and anyone who aided them, not in those defenseless innocents on the shuttles or the like. However, However, he's still loyal to Trakina, despite all the terrible things she's done as a knight to his queen, refusing to raise his weapon against her. His final words are an expression of disappointment as much as anger in what Trakina has become, despite all that he tried to do. The Stangwingers are boring foot soldiers. They have no real defining characteristics, nor were they ever particularly impressive against the Rangers. As pathetic as the Piranatrons were, you at least were shown that in large numbers, they could overwhelm the heroes, whereas the Stangwingers were as generic as as they came. The only time they were ever truly dangerous was when you strapped bombs to them. And even then, the Rangers survived more than one explosion that was caused. All in all, Power Rangers Lost Galaxy was a pretty good follow-up to In Space. While it lacked the familiar cast and the epic musical score, the story itself was solid, though very slow to start out. When the series began, the ratings were the highest Power Rangers had ever seen, but the ratings did start to drop as the show went on, and it took longer for them to get to the good bits, like the Magna Defender. And they stretched the search for the Lights of Orion a bit too long, in my humble opinion. However, after two heavy space operas, it was time to return the show to its roots a bit and see the Rangers fighting off evil forces on Earth again. That's why next time, the signal is calling for Lightspeed Rescue.
was an honor fighting with you guys. No, Leo. The honor was all ours. 